Four Degrees to the Streets is designed to empower anyone curious about places and spaces, not just persons with professional degrees or backgrounds. Here we will cover a host of topics, including transportation, health, housing, and the environment through the lens of racism, classism, and sexism, and give listeners the tools they need to overcome institutional barriers. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at the number four degrees pod and tune in every other Tuesday where Nemo and Jazz keep it four degrees to the streets. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the four degrees to the streets podcast. This is episode three. Um, I feel like season two is moving way faster <laughs> than season one, but maybe that's just because we, we know a little bit more about what's coming. Um, but what's up, Jasmine? How's your day going? Everything's going good. It's super cold. Fall is over. We're now in winter, but I'm I'm doing great. How are you? I can't complain. We're back on, a, on another Monday. A lot of our episodes in season one we did on the weekends, but such is life. <laughs> We've had to adjust and, and find other times um, based on work and schedules, um, which is a lot of what we're going to be talking about today. So uh, this episode is all about careers and planning, um, what that looks like, taking non-traditional planning routes, um, kind of outside of what we may have learned about in school. Um, I know Jasmine and I, when we met in school and what we're doing now are probably very different. Um, and so we wanted to invite some special guests to this episode to contribute to that conversation and their expertise. Um, so we have Michelle Juma and Jasmine Burnett, and they will introduce themselves in a quick little second. Um, but first I'll go ahead and get started um, and introduce Michelle. Um, we go back and so I'm appreciative of her joining today. Um, so Michelle um, has worked in the national nonprofit space um, across affordable housing. Um, she has background in technical assistance in economically challenged rural, urban, and island communities, focusing on housing and community development. Um, recently, she had completed an equitable recovery assessment pilot um, with cities that have had challenges due to COVID and opportunities to integrate racial equity into their long-term planning. She also has produced housing recommendations to Puerto Rico's economic and disaster recovery plan following hurricanes Irma and Maria um, and developed a safe guide, a keep safe guide for resilient housing design in island communities. Um, in addition to the housing space, Michelle has also developed several knowledge products on transit oriented development, resilient building practices and special interest topics in international development. She also holds a bachelor's of science in urban and regional studies from Cornell University, and she is also based in DC. So thanks, Michelle. Thank you for having me. I have the pleasure to introduce Jasmine Burnett. Um, Jasmine is based in Atlanta. She's a community organizer, trained urban planner and community development practitioner. She is the organizing director for Community Movement Builders, an organization working to build self-determined and liberated black communities based in cooperative economics. She is a co-founder and co-owner of The Spoons Consultancy, a black woman run and staff creative consulting cooperative. Jasmine began her career in the social sector consulting, helping large nonprofits. Additionally, she has helped smaller organizations create strong theories of practice and refine their intended impact goals. Rooted in the Atlanta community, Jasmine leads and has organized campaigns to defund and abolish the Atlanta Police Department via city budgeting, prevent the construction of local urban warfare, police training facility, and increase local civic engagement as a pathway towards sustained community involvement. Jasmine received her BA in government with a secondary in African American studies from Harvard University. She also attained her master's degree in city and regional planning and master's degree in public policy from George Institute of Technology. So thank you, Jasmine, for joining us and being the other Jasmine on the show. Yes, thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. So with that, Nemo and I have curated a few questions to discuss with Jasmine and Michelle about their experience um, 
in the field. So I'm just going to give you guys, we read your bios, but if you want to add anything to what we um, said, talk about your location, your kind of years in the field, um, if you will. I'll jump in. Um, so yes, uh, thank you for the introduction, Michelle Juma. I'm based in Washington, D.C., originally from Southern California. Um, and as someone who did not attend a graduate school, I like to include my full-time experience of five years in the field of urban planning, but I also say nine years sometimes if you include internships. Uh, but throughout that whole period, I've been pretty locked into the urban planning space um, and just jumping around to different opportunities. And it's really been eye-opening for where I'm at today. Perfect. Yeah, Jasmine, um, I'm based in Atlanta, from Atlanta. I've been in the urban planning field probably, I guess if we're being generous, three years if we count the time that I was also in grad school. So I finished my program in 2020. Um, my educational background for undergrad was government African-American studies, um, and then kind of realized that I was really passionate about place-based intervention centered on affordable housing. And that's what led me to Georgia Tech. Whereas the other Jasmine read from my bio, I got a master's in city and regional planning and another in public policy. So as you guys have probably can probably tell so far, um, all of us on the call are black women. That was not done on accident. It was done on purpose. Um, I think as we think about black women in the planning space, uh, we talked to Kristen Jeffers last season um, and we looked at the low percentages of uh, black um, black people and black women in the field throughout. Um, and so I think it only adds to that conversation about the different types of paths you can take in the planning career. Um, but I am interested to hear from all of you. Um, how did you discover urban planning as a profession? Um, and what really inspired and motivated you to continue to pursue it? Um, so we'll start with uh, the other Jasmine, Michelle, and then we'll go to uh, Jazz. Yeah, so I learned about urban planning, I want to say 2017, as I was working full time in nonprofit consulting in New York. Um, coming out of undergrad, I wasn't 100% sure what I wanted to do. I just knew that I wanted to generally make a positive impact <laughs> on Black people. And so that is what led me into social sector consulting. But through that work, I realized that I felt pretty disconnected from the people that I wanted to be interfacing with, people rooted in community who I wanted to serve. We were working with very big foundations, like very big nonprofits. And so even just generally as a consultant, you don't necessarily always get to see how your work turns out and how your plans turn out. And so I knew that that wasn't really gonna work for me long-term. Um, and so I was thinking about, you know, what am I actually interested in? And I remembered a class I took in undergrad where the professor was showing us research about how your zip code is more determinative of your life outcomes than your genetics. Um, and so obviously where you live is very much connected to your house, your housing situation. And so that's what motivated me to get into the housing space. Um, I knew I wanted to work in black communities specifically, black communities in the South um, being from Atlanta. And so, doing some research into, okay, what careers kind of create affordable housing, who's thinking about those things, um, and who's thinking about those things at a wider scale than just one community. And that's what led me to urban planning. Um, so definitely later in the game than a lot of people who may have gotten their undergraduate, undergraduate degree in planning, um, but that's what kind of brought me into my master's program at Tech. I'll jump in. and. I was very young. It was in high school. Uh, before I even knew the vocabulary associated with urban planning, I knew that I was just interested in cities or in communities. And I, I mentioned I grew up in Southern California, but was definitely in the suburbs. Um, but as a first generation Kenyan American, we would travel a lot, be able to go to visit my family, like the rural villages. And I knew that my interest in cities was much more than just like envying big city life. And it was trying to understand how some folks really did prefer like the casual, like slower comforts, um, how it was a very physical and emotional reaction to being in an industrial city or in a resort town. Um, and it was, I think about my sophomore year of high school that my aunt came to visit from South Africa. And she said that she was an urban planner there 
I had no idea what that really meant, but she just was gorgeous. She was saying that she just presented a paper in Germany and she was working on this nation building work. And I was like, wow, you get to just read and write papers all day. I'd love to do that. Uh, so I started to Google, like, is there a possibility that I could just jump into this kind of work? Um, because I thought that architecture was the closest thing to working in cities, um, but there really was a whole lane for me to start the space of city planning a little bit earlier on. And that's how I found Cornell's Urban and Regional Studies program um, and got started from there. So yes, it, it was very early on <laughs> that, I, that I entered planning, but I, I felt like that was the space for me, at least at that time. Uh, things ended up changing, but I was committed. I think you were very fortunate, Michelle, to have met someone who was an urban planner. I think that's a very unique experience. Um, for me, I actually learned about urban planning. I also have an undergrad degree in it, but I initially went to school to study psychology. I wanted to like help people overcome drug addictions. Um, took a couple psych classes and was like, mm, I feel like this is too small. I don't necessarily want to do this. Um, I was on the bus and I saw a sign for a new major that was urban planning and I Googled it and I was like, oh, this seems cool. Took a bunch of meetings with different faculty members and decided this is what I wanted to major in. Um, I was inspired really. So this was happening right around the time of um, the Flint water crisis. And or maybe it might've been like, it was like the first kind of article that just came out. And I was just really taken aback by it. So similar to you, Jasmine, like that public health in the built environment relationship was very pertinent to me up front. I guess that's kind of how the psychology piece came in. But that was something that really bothered me. And then um, I had grown up in the suburbs, but I had a family that lived in an inner city sense and kind of traveling between those two spaces. And I just was curious about the powers that be that made those spaces different because I knew the people that were there and they weren't much different from me. They worked hard. They didn't fit the stereotype of someone who you, the media might tell you is lazy or doesn't want to work or is on welfare. Like they were people, they were my family. So I knew them, but I couldn't understand why they still had to live in environments that didn't look like the one I was traveling from. And so those things together kind of helped me choose urban planning. Um, so I kind of came at it from like an environmental justice framework. And I know Nemo came through the same kind of lens as well. I w it wasn't on the bus though. <laughs> I didn't, I don't think I ever knew how you, how you discovered it. So I guess shout out to Blaustein and their, and their advertising. So thank you all for going into that first question, just to get us a good framework. So what did you see yourself doing when you started your planning education, whether that be when you started it as a graduate student or when you started it as an undergraduate student? And how is it related or different to the work that you're doing right now? And I'll start with Jasmine from the Spoons Consultancy. Yeah, so I thought that the work that I would be doing was coming up with innovative affordable housing strategies that centered housing as like the anchor for the provision of other community services. So once you have a safe and affordable place to live, then you can start thinking about how do you improve schools? How do you think about uh, making the built environment safer and more accessible? How do you think about community health programs? So kind of how do you use housing as, a, as an institution, as a focal point for improving entire communities. So that's what I thought I was gonna do. And that's kind of why I had both the planning degree because I wanted the technical kind of quantitative skills on how do you like map that out as a strategy, as a program. And then on the policy side, I want to think about, okay, if those interventions are successful um, on a micro scale, how can you create policies that would apply, for example, to a whole city? So that's what I thought I was gonna do. I think in grad school, I realized that the work in affordable housing can be very niche sometimes. And it can it's also just like the way it's funding, funded, kind of the 
whole theory around now lie tech and mixed income housing oftentimes pathologizes poor black people by saying oh we can't have all these low income people black people living together they'll create this culture of poverty they'll never you know ascend to anything better therefore we need middle class oftentimes white people to live in closer proximity to them to give them these better values and these better access more access to these different resources um and so given that that's the primary context for how affordable housing gets built, I realized that I didn't think that that would be a great fit for me just ideologically. Um, and then my perspectives on a lot of other things started to change, um, just kind of got politically radicalized in different ways um, and realized that a lot of my work was needed to be around organizing to destroy a lot of the systems that create the problems that we see and that we try to fix with like micro solutions, like one affordable housing complex. Um, so I think that also coupled with the ways in which I've seen these like neighborhood revitalization plans actually lead to significant amounts of gentrification and displacement, particularly in communities in Atlanta, just kind of made me a little disillusioned with practicing as a traditional urban planner. And so I wanted to think about how do I combine what I know that I've learned through this degree with kind of the radical organizing work that I think needs to happen to transform systems. And so that's how I ended up in this like quasi community development space, but also um, community organizing work as well. And while I was an undergrad, I was always very focused on doing international development. And that was coming from an academic or like research perspective. That's what I would want to do next. But also while I was there, Superstorm, Superstorm Stan Sandy took place. Um, and a lot of my courses pivoted to talk about emergency response and disaster recovery planning. And I thought that was really interesting. So as we got towards graduation, I thought that I was just going to pop over to D.C., get a job working for FEMA. Easy. Um, and I would start my career. And I had always planned on going back and doing a graduate degree um, before I ended up uh, well, actually, so there was probably about six months there when I still was searching after graduation, um, but I ended up working for an international development think tank in Washington, D.C., and that was an internship opportunity, but it would be very quickly that I realized it was not exactly what I thought it would be. And we were developing a lot of these reports, and I just started to think about is this in the interest of the funders or is this in the best interest of the communities that we're serving? Did I, as at the time, you graduated like 23, 22, um, as this 22 year old, why am I writing policy recommendations for what they should do in the global South? So it just felt very much like, I don't think this is the best way that I should be like working in the urban planning space if there is another black woman, another person of color that they could hire to this company and do the work, then I would love to create that space for them. Um, and they did try to offer opportunities to become full-time at the end of the six month internship, but I really decided that I wanted to look, look elsewhere and maybe focus more domestically. And I had started to get really interested in housing policy. And that's where I ended up at um, my most recent employer. So I've been there for a pretty significant time. Um, and we started to work in the affordable housing space. And I became, I entered in one of the um, junior level consulting roles. And I was able to use a lot of that research writing experience um, but I think that I was most successful in the role because of my interpersonal skills. I was able to communicate a lot of the technical um, jargon or understand like the needs assessment, strategic planning to folks who weren't as familiar with these processes. And since we are going to be in communities, working with residents, working with very diverse communities, I thought it was much more um, impactful for me to get that one-on-one -on -one experience and feel like I'm truly advocating for their needs when we are negotiating or working with a city government or with a major employer in that area. So it definitely was not where I thought I would end up, but it has allowed me to explore some different areas and gain exposure in a way that I did not even know was possible, especially at a more junior level when I had graduated. Thank you, Jasmine and Michelle. Um, I will add on to that a little bit about how 
what I thought I would see myself doing when I started my planning education. I found out about planning my senior year of high school. Um, so I was also pretty early um, and came into it from the environmental justice space. Um, and some of the examples that I was reading about and doing papers on were um, community led efforts that changed the course of um, any sort of environmental um, pollution or project that was going to harm a community that was mainly black and mainly low income. And I thought, okay, wow, with the power of community outreach and the communities having a voice, there's a lot of positive change that can happen and a lot of changes that can happen in their built environment and in their natural environment too. Um, and uh, kind of following that interest by the end of my undergrad, I did my final paper um, with a local um, town in the area and they were updating their comprehensive plan. Um, and I really focused on the community outreach aspect of it. But as I was going through that process um, and being the young black planning student who was helping this town that had an all white planning staff, I was like, okay, I really fear being tokenized in this process. I don't wanna have to always go to these meetings and fight to be the voice for black people. Um, and because I may not even understand, I may not be from that community, I might not be from that neighborhood, I'm not the expert um, and I don't wanna make things worse potentially. Um, so by the time I got to grad school, I thought I saw myself working in the nonprofit space exclusively and working with um, community-based organizations um, and doing capacity building. Um, and then when I first started grad school, I started working for a community development financial institution. Um, and I saw a lot of the uh, impact work they were doing. Um, but then I still kind of had that feeling of like, I don't know if it's for me to do this work because I haven't been finding a lot of good examples of it going well and it working. Um, and so I took a break from that internship position um, and I was having interesting experiences traversing the New Jersey streets um, on bike, on foot, on bus, just different, just all types of different modes because I didn't have a car. Whereas when I lived in the Seattle area, I had a car and put their public transit was good to me. <laughs> and so uh, just having that experience, I uh, saw that there was a research opportunity at the um, New Jersey Bike and Pedestrian bicycle and pedestrian resource center. And I was like, well, I feel passionately about this as a resident in this town. And uh, I think I could write some papers about it and see, see what happens. Um, and I've kind of stayed in that space ever since, um, active transportation, um, if people are busing, walking, biking, um, any mode of transportation that involves movement um, and then making sure that movement is equitable for people regardless of their mobility or their age or gender. Um, and I think uh, when I think about uh, what I'm doing now, I'm still in the transportation space. I'm still in the environment space. I'm still in the public work space um, and thinking about how to make those resources and investments better for residents. I just want to add on a follow-up question is, tell us kind of about what do you perceive to be your impact for the work that you do now? Um, and we'll start with Michelle, go to Jasmine, and then we'll end again with Nemo. That's a good question. I feel like as a consultant, it, it can be a little challenging sometimes. Um, I guess the cons or the, the downside of it is we are typically in communities for a very short period of time. Um, the shortest, I get probably three month engagement. I've been in some cities for a year, almost two years, if we end up getting an extension or something. Um, but I always felt that my impact was being a community builder, a relationship builder. And if we were going to serve as a liaison between the city and between the residents, yes, it is up to the client, whoever they may be, whether or not they implement any of our recommendations. But I know that I'm not doing my job unless like all of those voices are at the table. We're going to build into this process um, any number of community engagement workshops or sort of, of extend the time or readjust budget so that we do have all these folks at the table. Um, and there is the data to support it, even if we don't wanna look at the facts and figures, if we don't wanna really take a hard look at where we're uh, budgeting our time, our energy, our resources, just to say that, well, this is, this is the community that we're creating. This is the sort of situation that we are contributing to. And I feel like, to even start that that conversation um, is where we can start having some like really good growth or, or movement from there. 
So I think that is the role that I often play. And I'm hoping that in the future, I can start to move more towards that implementation and seeing now what does it look like after we've left the community um, to five years later, if they actually were able to see the progress that they wanted. Yeah, and I mean, I would say that hopefully <laughs> my impact is fostering and creating autonomous, liberated Black communities, um, which obviously re requires a, a lot of work given where we are in the current um, current conditions. Um, but for me, that means building the housing, environmental, social institution landscape and capacity for us to really govern ourselves. Um, so on the like economic side, that's all of the work that I do with my consulting cooperative. So thinking about how do we work differently so that we're not stuck in this like endless cycle of capitalism that is really largely to blame for a lot of the social ills that we're trying to deal with as planners. Um, and then also importantly, how do we build capacity for community control of their neighborhoods? So how, what does it look like to have um, land banks or you know land trusts, shared ownership models for property? both on the residential and commercial side of things? How do we build um, local cooperative businesses such that everyone is kind of benefiting from the profits derived or created by the workers in that um, community? How do we think about kind of providing for our own safety and security so that we're not interfacing with policing institutions, which we know are also harmful on the housing side. They're the ones that are carrying out evictions. They're the ones that are enforcing foreclosures. Um, so how do we think about creating our own liberated communities that are kind of based in those cooperative principles? Um, so yeah, I would say that that's like the nexus of my work and the impact that I want to have. I would say um, the impact, I think that's a really good question um, that I think is what keeps maybe most of us going on a day-to-day -day basis um, despite challenges or, or changes in, in work and day-to-day um, -day tasks. Um, but I think the impact, the way I think about it is just making uh, folks' lives easier. Um, and, and the work that I do, sometimes that can be a slow process, um, but eventually it becomes tangible and one can see it, but one just has to be patient enough to see it through, um, and not become jaded, um, while it's happening, um, and staying true to that goal that, if this will make someone's life easier, then we should stay committed to it and invest um, and provide a lot of services that the government is meant to provide. And with that, I will take us to our next question. Um, we've heard a little bit about kind of the journey um, that everyone has had to get to planning. Um, and so now we wanna think a little bit about the future. So. The question is, what are your professional goals for the future in the next three to five years? Um, and even looking further than that, maybe 10 years down the line. Um, so I will start with Jasmine Burnett and we'll go to Michelle and then Jasmine. So I feel like this is not the answer that y'all might be looking for, but I would love to not have to work really and truly. Like if we could really have it our way, some leisure and some rest <laughs> would be nice instead of always trying to hustle for these professional goals. But I think in the context of the work that we're all trying to do, I would love to be able to be a full-time organizer that doesn't currently <laughs> manifest in a way that would pay all of my bills. So I take on other projects as well. Um, but I think being able to fully commit myself to this organizing work would be ideal. Um, I don't really have a ton of like super professional aspirations. Like I'm not trying to be secretary of HUD or anything like that. Um, but I would like to gain, I think, just for my own skill set, like more design skills on the urban design space. That's not really something that I did a lot of in undergrad um, and really kind of be a planning practitioner that's able to build a lot of the systems that we read about in, in books um, and to actualize a lot of the theories that we talk about when we talk about, you know, cooperative land structures, land ownership structures and things like that. So, yeah. So the last few years specifically have been a journey uh, for me, but I find myself really interested in the intersection of real estate, 
and community development work and a little bit of marketing. And with that, I'm interested in pursuing um, a graduate degree, specifically an MBA, and using that to pivot into the real estate space. I have gotten really involved in economic development with some of my last few projects. And I just find it so interesting when you hear about projects that are celebrating local cultures, are celebrating Black history. Um, there's, there's one project specifically, I believe it's called Destination Crenshaw. And I believe it's almost like two miles, but they're making sure that all of the businesses in the area are Black owned or minority owned. They're creating green space within the community. They're getting investors who really are committed to preserving the experience and the, the sense of like safety that is there. And if I could offer my own skill set and be able to facilitate some of those transactions often, um, but some of those like key fundamental uh, community building processes, then that is the space that I would really like to be in and, and create happen. Um, so creating our own beloved communities in the next few years is where I would love to be and doing a little bit more of that economic development, real estate community development work. I think, Michelle, that the desire to be, to pursue an MBA and to pursue economic development is a really good one because it gets to Jasmine's point about capitalism kind of creating the systems that hold people back especially black people in black communities and so I feel like using your your powers for good right I feel like people with MBAs who with finance degrees are because they're really trying to scam the system right and own as many properties as they can and charge as many rents as they can without necessarily putting back into the quality of the the unit that they're owning but I would love to see more people that are trying to kind of rejecting capitalism embrace it and try to turn it around and that in itself is like how can we even do that as a conversation that we can have but I think that that's really cool I, I it's a conversation we can start to have like we can redefine what it means to be successful what it means to be profitable what are the outcomes that we are looking for when we create like holistic housing or like wraparound services for our residents so I think if we can start to bring different perspectives to the table or maybe get some of those like local business or local employers to think about how, what does it mean for them to be a part of this community and shape this identity? It's not just suddenly you're branded as being from this urban area and it makes you authentic and edgy. Like, no, you're actually giving back. You're creating opportunities. You're creating upward mobility, not just stability, not just a job for the community, but something that's really going to create long-term opportunities and there's just so many people who are involved in that process of just creating a neighborhood that I, I I still I don't have a job title I don't know if it's me leading someone's local bid but uh being a part of that process is I think a great opportunity for us to redefine what we're looking for in our in our cities and what we expect from our local like utility service providers employers all of that Thank you for further elaborating. I appreciate it. I don't know. I've been 10 years. Like Jasmine said, I'm, I'm trying to be sitting at my house, like reading a book. Um, I would really like to Michelle's point, develop my finance skills. That is a goal of mine. Um, I work in affordable housing finance primarily. Um, and I want to be able to better navigate that space and I feel like having stronger having a stronger finance background whereas my planning provided me that planning gives you technical assistance in a different way than like finance modeling and stuff um and that policy background so I want to bridge those two together because I think having that finance skill having the planning technical assistance skills having the policy background would make me just like superwoman in in planning and to Jasmine's point again, like, I just want Black people to have nice things. Like, that's why I started planning. And so I want, I feel like those skills will really help me achieve that. Um, Nima, I'm curious to hear, I know we're going around your goals or your professional aspirations in the future. 
Yeah, I mean, I really have to add on to what Jasmine said. There's a reason why we didn't say like, what's your dream job? I personally don't dream of extended labor <laughs> in any in any form of way. Rest is the resistance. Um, but I think really how I've seen trying to frame my planning career after graduating was getting a little bit of experience in a lot of different places to kind of complete a cycle or if I'm thinking of it like a circle, I'm like completing that that coming full circle and like getting a little bit of experience in different places um, to really be serving an advising role um, to pull from lived experiences, education um, and work experience to shed light on what I think could be done better. Um, and I remember when thinking about getting a master's and I was asking an advisor like, well, how do I know that I don't necessarily, that I, like, what if I decide I want to get a PhD in this? Like why, what would be the thing that would go further? Um, and they had told me, well, you should get a PhD if you, um, think that you have a way that this, that, that something can be done better. And now I'm not saying I'm going to get a PhD <laughs> in planning. Um, but I think about that often, um, how to just continue learning, um, in the space. So yeah, I guess in the next three to five years, um, I am open to moving up um, into more senior roles, um, serving in a, you know, in a deputy or a director capacity. Um, and then in the next 10 years, I definitely want to be in that, um, in, in kind of a taking a step away, having people hire, hired to do <laughs> the things, the things that I, that I may tell them. Um, but even in the next one year, I'm actually interested in um, potentially becoming an adjunct professor uh, maybe at a local community college or a university um, to, you know, teach, teach the kids. And someone helped me find planning when I was in high school and community college. And um, I would love to just share the field with more um, young black girls who are interested. I think that's great, Nemo. Um, we're going to jump to the next question, which is what do you wish you knew at the beginning of your planning journey? Um, and it kind of ties into the last question, which is what advice do you have for any listeners who are interested in pursuing planning? So what do you wish you knew in the beginning? Any advice you have for listeners who are interested in pursuing planning? Um, and we'll start with Nemo, then we'll go to Michelle, and then we'll end with Jasmine. Then we can just have a conversation before we wrap up. Oh, I knew writing these questions and then not thinking about your answer <laughs> is definitely what I did. Um, what do I wish I knew at the beginning of the planning journey that I might not be interested in it that much at one point. <laughs> um, I, and it's hard to say that. And I feel bad, but it's like, why? And I think it's sometimes, I think planning is an easy field to adapt, attach your identity to. You can say, I'm a planner. I'm doing planning. And I do planning work. Um, and so I think I would tell myself to be mindful about not attaching my identity to, to just that. And I think just being open to digging deeper into the other aspects of planning. Um, like I wish I knew more about the housing space. I've just somehow kind of like have dodged it in certain like jobs or, um, or academics. I was very much focused in certain places. Um, and so I think I would just tell myself to be open to the different forms that planning can take. Um, cause I even got into the budget space kind of on accident. Um, and, uh, for listeners, um, yeah, I would say that does kind of connect about the identity piece, but, um, yeah, I would just say to continue to be open, to continue to always talk to people. Planning is a, is a small town. <laughs> um, it's, uh, everyone knows each other. Um, and, uh, but I think my experience has been that fellow planners are open. Um, there's been planners I've met at conferences years ago that we just stay connected and are always open to helping each other. So I think be open to getting help early in your career, um, and be open to giving back throughout all uh, throughout, you know, throughout your journey as well. I'll just jump in and say really quickly, I think that point, Nemo, about attaching your identity to it, I think is something that maybe all of us on this panel can relate to. Like we all cared about places. We all cared about space. Like that was our, our nature, our things that we were passionate about. And so we kind of selected majors or fields that allowed us to do those things. And so I think that's something that ranged through for particularly 
black people who choose to do planning work because like we could have chose to be bankers and like not even address our communities not even know any of the problems and just worked at PNC Bank and kept it pushing and not even addressed anything and so we chose because of our passions to still kind of give back because in many sense planning is a giving back type of profession we are definitely not compensated for the level of knowledge and information that we bring to the table so just wanted to add that in. No, thanks for adding that. There's a lot of nods and snaps happening that you guys can't see. But yeah, no, that's a word like you don't we don't go into this. For, there's no promise. If you go to the U.S. Bureau of Labor and Statistics, planners on average start around 50, 60 K if you have a master's degree. <laughs> so it's like we didn't go into this for any sort of self reason, selfish reasons, but for out of a care of places and communities. I feel like you two both hit on everything I was going to say. Um I was more so going to present it as I, I also had like a very narrow scope of what this would look like. And if not narrow, I knew like the milestones I had to plan. Like I was going to do this internship, work somewhere, go back to get my master's, maybe even do a PhD. Like this was just, I was going to dive in. And I was really hard on myself when I started to feel like, wait a minute, I don't know if this is exactly what I want to do or where I want to be. Like the topic area was still super interesting to me, but day in and day out, is this the job that I want to do? And I was also like very young. So I was comparing myself to my friends who were on the more clear tracks, like in like pursuing a law school, pursuing a me medical school, and they have just the basic things they need to tick off the list. And in X amount of years, you'll be done. And like, that's it. Um, and I really wish I would have been nicer to myself and allowed myself to explore those other opportunities to explore my interests. I think at one point in time, I was like, oh yeah, I'm gonna just study all of this. And like, I'm gonna relearn GIS. And like, that's what I'm gonna do because that's how I'll get a job and dive into that space. I'm not interested in that at all. No, yes, everyone keeps asking for it, but I don't want to do that. So I just was like, this is the only way I can be successful and I need to make this happen even if it makes me miserable. And it took me a long time, probably still working on that, to be honest, but everything isn't going to happen in a clear path. And we're always going to be recreating ourselves, our careers. Sometimes an opportunity just presents itself and you say, hey, why not? I could do that for a little while, get the experience and see where it takes me. Um, yeah, that's, that's really where it's been at. Yeah, definitely echoing everything everyone has said, I think, Jumping off of Michelle's point, one thing I would definitely recommend is if you're thinking about going to grad school, take some time in the workforce. It'll really help put things in perspective, especially as you think about how you approach school. I feel like a lot of planners are also super type A people. And so you might, if you're coming to an undergrad, think that you need to have that same type of like, I don't know, I'm all about my studies. Like I need to have my head down, but grad school is completely different. Like you're actually there to make connections, um, to learn more about the subject detached from all of, like the accolades. Like you don't need to be in a bunch of student organizations. Like you can really kind of be selfish in your reasons <laughs> for being in school and what you're trying to get out of it. So I always recommend like work for a little bit before you go back to school, um, if you're not 100% sure, especially if you're not 100% sure what you wanna do. Um, I would also say one thing I wish I knew is just how many different career opportunities there are within planning like you don't have to be a city planner um and I think there's a lot of pressure to feel like you need to fit into that or to like work for even a private planning um firm as a consultant but you can get the knowledge that you've gotten about the interesting topics be it housing community development environmental things even land use and apply that to different careers or blend things and make your own career that's not a traditional path um so yeah I would just say like maintain a sense of creativity and how you think about your professional development life and realize that it doesn't have to be a set defined thing and that you can try something for a year and decide that you don't want to do it anymore um, and you can think about how you can complement your different skill sets so if you are someone who's super creative or interested in communications you can do exactly what <laughs> we're doing on this podcast and come up with a creative way to talk about urban planning through podcasting um, so yeah, your career can really take any different shape that you want it to, and it should, you should definitely leverage the other skills outside of just like your 
topical focus area when you think about the work that you want to do. Thank you, ladies, all for giving us your time and your thoughts and opinions on this and sharing your experience, as well as your advice. Um, I think for me, and I'm just going to echo Jasmine's sentiments, the number of places you can work with this skill set is so vast and so large that you don't have to limit yourself. And you're going to feel um, intimidated because your classmates might be getting like really good internships at like WSP and KPN and like all these like super elite professional planning organizations but if you're working in the nonprofit space if you're working in the advocate space like that is still a very good use of your time if that's something that you're passionate about um and I'll end with that um I guess I'll take us out Nemo you have any other comments yeah I was just gonna um say again thank you all for sharing so many nuggets I feel like definitely when we're promoting this episode we have to say like I know y'all may not want to listen to the whole 45 minutes but I promise you just it we turn up at the end you're gonna you don't want to miss this <laughs> you want to hear you want to hear these nuggets um but thank you ladies so much um I really appreciate it and um this has been an invigorating conversation as I think we're all just in different phases of um, still on our journey, um, but still have so much to share about what we've learned so far. Um, and so, you know, tune in with us every other Tuesday. Um, we drop episodes. Um, you can find us on Instagram and Twitter at the number four degrees pod. Um, and yeah, definitely stay connected with us. Um, reply. We are available in the DMs over email. Um, we, we answer, we're, we're human. We, we want to hear from you all and hear your feedback. Uh, so I'll add to that. We have a subscription to a four degrees to the streets, family kind of newsletter. We want to stay connected with you in other ways outside of social media. So if you click the link in either our Instagram or Twitter bios, you can just drop in your email and we'll add you to our email links and peace out y'all.